All right, we will get started. Thank you so much for joining this morning. My name is Jenna Witherby, and I'm one of the advisors at 401k Plan Professionals. And this is our quarterly plan sponsor fiduciary training. We provide these trainings every quarter because not only do we think it's important for you as committee members, plan sponsors, plan fiduciaries to understand your roles and your responsibilities, but we also like to outline our roles and our responsibilities when it comes to being a co-fiduciary with you. So this will be about 30 minutes. I have a lot of content to run through, so I will be speaking pretty fast. Um, the, the slides have a lot of great content on them. Just know, too, that afterwards you'll be sent the recording of this, and it'll also be posted on our website and our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find us there at 401k Plan Professionals, and that's a really great way to stay in touch with not only these trainings, but we also have a monthly webinar series where we cover a variety of different topics, and then you get a notification every time there's a new video that's out there. And feel free to share this as well with anybody you think would find value in it. Afterwards, you'll also get a really nice fiduciary checklist that summarizes everything that I'll cover today. And there's some compliance deadlines on the second page of that checklist as well. So that's a really good takeaway and just to keep on file. So we're going to cover roles, responsibilities, duties, overseeing investments, overseeing providers, helping your plan participants, plan administrator basics, and then cover fiduciary liability, insurance, and bonding last. So let's talk about your role as a 401k or 403b plan fiduciary. Um, really quick, I have a poll. Um, so let's launch that. I just like to get a, a feel for where you're at. So rate your confidence when discussing who's a fiduciary and your own role and responsibilities. Just give it a couple more seconds here. Okay, so it looks like everyone has voted that they feel somewhat confident. So that's good. And I think through trainings like this and um, in your day-to-day um, -day role and working with our team that you can just build off of that and gain more confidence. And feel free to, to hop on to as many of these quarterly trainings as you'd like. I think it's good to always brush up and um, just uh, further our knowledge. So fiduciaries have important responsibilities in protecting retirement benefits. These are individuals who make or have the authority to make the decisions on behalf of the plan. So we can categorize fiduciaries in three kind of main buckets. So someone who exercises discretionary or control over the management of the plan or the management of the disposition of the assets, provides investment advice for a fee. So that would be our team there, 401k plan professionals. And then anyone who has discretionary authority or responsibility on the administration of such a plan. A key point here is that your title doesn't matter when it comes to ERISA, being a fiduciary. That's really irrelevant. It's really more your actions and the functions. Um, it, it doesn't matter if you intend to be a fiduciary, know you're one. It doesn't matter if your name is listed anywhere, but it comes down to what are you actually doing in practice? There are two types. There's named fiduciaries. This could be someone that is listed in one of the legal plan documents, in the adoption agreement, in the summary plan description. This could be an employer, company officer, administrator, trustee. But on the right, there's also unnamed fiduciaries. So someone who does play a role in managing the 401k, but they're not named anywhere. And a great example here is uh, someone in the payroll department that submits contributions, they're responsible for making timely contributions, but their name may not be listed anywhere on any sort of documents. So it's important to understand which plan related activities are fiduciary activities and which ones are not. So we have some activities that are fiduciary and some are just business decisions, business activities. So I have a list here. Um, on the left would be fiduciary activities such as selecting your service provider, 
selecting your investment advisors that you work with, monitoring the plan investments. On the right, some examples of non-fiduciary activities, deciding to have a plan in the first place, uh, making an amendment to your plan or approving to terminate the plan. Um, so there is a distinction there that's important. Um, so make sure when you take steps to implement the decisions, the business decisions, or those who you hire to implement those business decisions, make sure you know that they're acting as a fiduciary for the plan. So there's options for outsourcing. A lot of times plan sponsors, committee members, they know all the different aspects of being a fiduciary, but they don't have the time the desire, or maybe the expertise for the different areas. So it's very common for plan fiduciaries to outsource certain pieces of their plan. Um, so the record keeping, you know, you probably work with a 401k provider that holds the assets, holds the accounts, does the main record keeping of the plan. You could even outsource um, the approval and processing of certain types of distributions. Internally, a lot of providers will have a service that you can elect where they approve the hardship distributions or they can approve the loans or quadros. Investment advisory services, so that's where our team you know, plays a role there and claims administration. So let's talk about your basic fiduciary duties. And Overarching, we can say a fiduciary's performance of these legal duties will be measured in large part by two key concepts, loyalty and prudence. So you'll see that and hear that quite a bit. So ERISA requires that fiduciaries act solely in the interest of the plan participants and beneficiaries for the purpose of providing benefits to them and that the participants pay only reasonable plan expenses. You yourself may be a participant, right, in your 401k plan, but it's important to remember when it comes to being a fiduciary, you're not thinking solely about yourself, your individual account, your individual investments or goals or objectives, but you're thinking holistically for the entire group. And prudence. ERISA requires that a fiduciary act with the care, skill, prudence, and diligence under the circumstances then prevailing that a prudent person acting in a light capacity and familiar with such matters would use. So basically doing the right thing, right? It's, it's, um, ERISA describes it as being the highest known to the law. It's critical to understand that the test for evaluating um, prudence in plan administration or investments is primarily one of process. So that last word, process. Um, it's very important to have an outlined process in place and documentation of that um, when it comes to fulfilling your fiduciary responsibilities. Uh, really, that process is the cornerstone. Um, so know that when you make decisions based on the information that you have at that time, um, that will not be judged later. Um, if, if circumstances change. So for, for example, let's say you are monitoring a specific investment. It's been on the watch list for several quarters. You have documented in previous committee meetings that you have concerns with this fund because of certain reasons that you outline. And let's say you make a change to that investment. Down the road, maybe three, four, five quarters, it does start improving on, imp on performance and it recovers. You're not going to be judged negatively because you made that decision at that point in time. You um, were making a reasonable decision based on what you knew at that time. Not all decisions turn out to be right in the long run. Not all investments are successful. And, and it's important to not worry that you'll be liable if if um, as long as you used a prudent process with that decision. Um, document, document, document. You'll hear us say that, that a lot. Um, you'll see that a lot um, when it comes to fiduciary matters. And really that's why it's important too to align with a group that has a process in place. So since we work in the 401k, 403b space 100% of the time, we have a really well-oiled machine, right? We have a process in place and um, 
we know the importance of the documentation and checking those boxes. Um, and, and we're covered in case that there is any sort of questions or audits or um, um, questions that are raised basically with the decisions that we made. And if we were to kind of bucket fiduciary decisions into a handful of areas, it would be these five. So managing the plan with only the interests of the participants and their beneficiaries in mind, we talked about that, keeping plan expenses to a reasonable level, following the terms of the plan's governing documents. So for instance, what does the adoption agreement say? What does the summary plan description say? Are, are those actions being carried out in your day-to-day -day practice? Ensuring the plan's investments are diversified and then doing this all with care, skill, prudence, and diligence. So wrapping it all with a bow um, with, with the prudence. Um, some plans do have, say, a board of directors and decide to have a separate document called the committee charter, which basically means the board of directors gives discretion to the committee members, to the individuals who are making decisions um, on the plan, fiduciary decisions for the plan. I don't see it often, but that is something that's just another kind of layer um, of protection. Overseeing investments. When it comes to the plan investments, um, most 401k, 403b plans are set up so the participants themselves can decide how they want to individually invest. Um, and we don't just say, okay, good luck. There's thousands of mutual funds out there. You can pick whatever ones we want. No, we, we shave it down to a core investment lineup inside your plan. So maybe there's 20 to 25 different mutual fund options that participants can choose from. And a lot of times this piece of fiduciary responsibility is something that is outsourced to investment advisors such as our team. Um, so plan sponsors decide to appoint an investment committee that's given decision-making authority with respect to the selection and ongoing oversight of the plan investments in addition to hiring our team. And a lot of times the investment committee members are um, human resources, professionals, CFO, um, controller, could be the president, CEO, depending on the size of the company. We see a lot of different arrangements um, and there's no right or wrong with that. We just document in the minutes who is appointed as committee members and we make sure that they go through fiduciary training such as this so they understand their roles and responsibilities. So our role as fiduciaries or co-fiduciaries with you, I should say, really comes down to one of two things. Um, in the box, I have 321 and 338, which will be primarily what we talk about. There is another type of fiduciary called 316, a lot of numbers here. Um, and 316 is being a fiduciary more on the administrative side of things to handle reporting and notices and disclosures that need to go out to your participants. So sometimes we'll see providers that have a 316 service or third party administrators you could hire to offer a 316 service. Um, but where we work day to day is in the 321 or 338 capacity. And the only difference between 321 and 338 is in the 338 environment, when we come on as investment advisors, we get the final say. Not only do we come to the table with analysis and recommendations, but in a 338 environment, we would be able to say, this is the change we're making. We have discretionary over it. Versus in a 321 environment, we're still coming to the table, serving as a subject matter expert, bringing the analysis, coming with recommendations, but in that case, the committee members themselves get the final say. So sometimes there's a formal vote. You know, um, we can tell you what we recommend, but ultimately committee members can make that decision. And you know, we don't we don't charge extra for being a 338. I think some advisory teams do. Um, we really look at it as we're doing the same amount of work. 
we're providing the same analysis and recommendations. It's just that final kind of technicality of who gets to sign off on it, who gets the final say. And note too that as a fiduciary, as a plan sponsor, you can't completely step down ever from your role as a fiduciary. So you still have responsibility for hiring and monitoring your providers, hiring and monitoring your investment advisory team, making sure you're putting the money in on time. So there's certain things you can't completely get away from, but with aligning with partners in this space, you can mitigate or reduce your fiduciary liability as much as possible. So with respect to the plan investments, um, it's important to know that there's no one size fits all. Every plan, every um, set of demographics, um, the objectives of, of a specific plan um, are different from plan to plan, from company to company. Um, so there's there's really no one size fits all. But again, kind of tying to that documentation point, um, as long as you are stating the reasoning why and the discussions ha had about it and um, documenting the uh, underneath the hood, kind of lifting it, why did we do this, then you're going to be just fine. Um, it's important to have many available options. So we talk about diversified investments, um, different types of investment vehicles. Typically in our space, we see mutual funds, sometimes collective investment trusts. Very rarely do we see company stocks, but we're wanting to make sure that there's a diverse array of types of investments, asset um, classes that your participants have to choose from. So making sure we have large, mid and small cap US investments. Do we have some international investments? Do we have some fixed income options? And again, you know, I'm kind of, I'm reiterating some points here, but fiduciaries are not judged by the investment results that they achieve for their plans, but rather on whether they acted prudently in making those decisions. One piece that we cover in our investment committee meetings is we look at the weighted average return of the plan over different time frames, And we always say there's no requirements with how your plan needs to perform, but we're really just looking at this as another data point, right? As just a way to benchmark. But really at the end of the day, there's no right or wrong or set of standards when it comes to performance. You may have heard of an investment policy statement. This is another layer to protect yourselves as fiduciaries, uh, but this is really a guide. It's an outline. Um, it's a document to have in place that talks about the process we have to monitor, select, remove different investment options. And it's loose, it's broad enough where you're not backing yourself into a corner. It's not stating things like, we will always have funds that perform this way, um, but it's it's more on the process side of things. And we do work with ERISA attorneys to look, look over this from time to time and just make sure that our verbiage is appropriate here. Um, it's not something that we look at at every single committee meeting, but periodically we'll bring that, make sure we have an updated copy and signed by the, the current committee members, just as there's changes to the committee members. These are just some screenshots of reports and analytics um, that we may bring forth to a committee meeting. So we use our own proprietary reports and data in addition to Morningstar and internally through our registered investment advisor, we have access to other analytical reports. Um, so we look at the past performance, we're looking at category rankings. Um, we're even stripping out how many people are in each of these funds in this plan. What are the assets? What is What are the funds that are on our watch list? Funds we may want to take a deeper dive on. Um, this is a 12-point qualitative and quantitative scoring system that we use as well. Um, so we have 12 different um, sets of criteria and we're wanting our funds to score a seven out of 12 or higher. Um, if they're not for several quarters in a row, we'll put it on the watch list. And this is a great way for us to not only see how is it scoring right now, but how has it scored the 
previous six quarters. So that's just a bit on the investments themselves. Now let's talk about overseeing your service providers. Um, so this would be, you know, the record keepers that you're partnering with, the third party administrators, auditors, uh, but you're required to reach informed decisions, um, meaning you must give appropriate considerations to the facts and circumstances that you know or should know are relevant. Um, now, there's no requirement for even hiring service providers in the first place, but again, here's here's just a list of some of the more common service providers that we see plans align with. And not all providers out there are created equal, of course. There are maybe um, different areas that they excel in or certain sizes of plans that they work best on, or are they do they play well with third party administrators or do they like to be bundled and do all the compliance testing and reporting on their own? So this is part of this is like clients lean on us to kind of know from our experience and from talking with these different service providers, who's going to be a best fit for you. And a lot of times when we're, we're looking for a provider for a plan or doing an RFP and getting bids from other providers, you know, we don't just go to one or two. A lot of times we'll go to three to five different providers and benchmark them against each other and kind of decide what's most important to this client, what's most important to this company, to this committee when it comes to um, the record keeping of their plan. Fees are a big consideration. Um, over the last several years, um, there's been a lot of clarity shed on 401k plan fees. They can be very complicated and there's different ways that plans are structured. The thing to remember here is that your plan provider doesn't need to be the least expensive arrangement. Um, however, you need to uh, show through documentation that the fees that you're paying your service provider are reasonable. And the way that we do that is through that benchmarking process and not only looking at the numbers, but also looking at the services that they're providing. Here's just a couple screenshots from one of the benchmarking reports that we use. It's called Fiduciary Benchmarks. And in this one, it's not looking at specific providers, but it's looking at um, for your plan size, it's comparing it to plans in the similar size kind of range. Um, and it's comparing your fees against all the other plans in this database that are your similar size. So we include this in every single um, committee meeting. We, we like to look at this periodically. Um, and this is a nice quick way. And then, and then another way that I mentioned is actually getting an RFP, going to several different providers and saying, what would you charge to run this plan. And we can even give them the exact same investments across all these providers. So it's truly apples to apples and say, what would you charge? Um, so this is just a, a screenshot from this RFP tool that we have to not only look at cost, but um, look at the qualitative factors as well. Now, helping participants. This is an area too that a lot of plan sponsors will outsource to say their investment advisory team. This is an area that my team definitely has a lot of passion for. Um, there's, there's a lot of requirements with notices and um, disclosures that your participants need. And so um, we can help you partner with your provider to make sure that they're receiving those, whether your provider is sending them out or at least just they provide them to you and then you send them out to your staff. And this varies from plan to plan, but fee disclosures, um, summary plan description, anytime you make a, a material change to your plan, if you're changing providers, there's a blackout notice. If you're changing investments, there's a notice. And then if you have a safe harbor or say an automatic enrollment type arrangement, there's separate notices for that too. So it's a, it's a lot to keep track of. And um, that's a, again, that's an area that we'd partner with your provider on um, just to make sure that we are covering that, that requirement. 
And making sure you choose the plan design that fits your specific needs. So are you going to be offering a match? Do you have a lot of turnover? What do you want for your service requirement for eligibility? Um, are, how are we going to provide education? Will it be in person? Will it be virtual? Will it be hybrid? Will it be group? Will it be individual? Will it be both? Um, so really, it, um, the way that we approach things is it's very custom to you and your staff and your demographics and your geographical location. Um, so these are some questions that might evaluate how well your plan is working for you. So we look at different metrics like what is the participation, what is the a uh, average deferral, per, um, deferral rate, how many of your participants are on track to reach their retirement goals. Here we too, we lean on the providers. They have a lot of great tools and in, in most cases have a lot of great reporting capabilities. Um, so we can go um, pretty deep in, you know, what, what set of employees is contributing, but they're not getting the full match yet, or what group of employees is eligible, but they're not contributing at all. So they're missing out completely on the match, um, just different things like that. A note that not all advisors can provide fiduciary advice to your participants. We can, we are able to give individual recommendations and advice, uh, but there are advisors out there that their broker dealer or their registered investment advisor doesn't let them claim fiduciary status. So um, just note that there's a distinction there. Uh, we do targeted communication sometimes as well. Um, so I kind of touched on, you know, if there's folks that are eligible, but they're not contributing, or here's a great example. If we notice there's participants in their 20s and 30s that are 0% in equities or very low in equities, we could do targeted communications um, to, to touch on proper asset allocation strategies. Um, beneficiaries, we can we can pull data, you know, who in this plan does not have a beneficiary loaded into the system yet. So we can um, really kind of hone in and tailor our message to certain groups of people. So we've really gotten away from just the boilerplate, you know, enrollment presentation. We really try to um, switch up the topics and have it be pertinent for them and their life stage. Um, so we do a variety, you know, group meetings, one-on-one. -on -one. We do a lot of virtual um, the last few years, we've done a lot more virtual than we ever have before, but we can separate by, you know, age, life stage. Uh, we can do focuses on Social Security, Medicare. Uh, we can do a deeper dive on investments. Um, we have a really great financial wellness series that we created. And so I can talk through that step by step. And it's nice, too, when we have resources and leave behinds. Um, so we have this series, for example, is out on our website. It's out on our YouTube channel. Um, and a lot of times our group meetings lead into one-on-one -on -one sessions too, where we can get more specific answer questions, um, help someone log in and actually navigate around their site. Um, so they really go hand in hand. Okay, plan administrator basics. Um, so this would be uh, making sure you're following the plan documents, um, following the tax code rules that apply to your plan. Um, your adoption agreement is a very lengthy document. Um, so making sure that you're complying with all the provisions that are inside that document and leaning on your provider and your investment advisors to help you with that. Um, these are just some of many um, different important aspects. So who may be covered on your plan? How much can they contribute? Um, compensation is a big one. So how is compensation calculated? Um, will your company be doing matching or profit sharing contributions? Is there a vesting schedule? And then what are the distribution options for your plan? Um, you may incur an IRS audit. Um, definitely let us know if you ever get contacted by the IRS that you're going to have an audit. We will help you with finding all of the documentation. Um, that's why we save everything. Um, you should have a fiduciary file and save everything. Uh, but there's IRS audits. And then separately from that, there could be DOL audits. Um, 
there's been an increased um, just look on 401k plans in general. Um, A lot of it that we're seeing in litigation is based on 401k plan fees and different investment offerings. Um, So here, you know, we're very in tune with what the Department of Labor is wanting to be seeing as far as documentation on your funds and your fees and covering all the bases. Here's just an example. Um, This was a, a somewhat recent lawsuit that was brought by Northwestern University employees who claimed that the plan fiduciaries were violating ERISA's duty of prudence because they were failing to monitor and control the record keeping fees. And they were offering um, too complex of investment options, um, some that were pretty expensive. And the committee thought that they were okay because they were offering a variety of different types, mutual funds and annuities. Um, However, even though there was a variety of different investments, the takeaway here was that all of the plan's investments must be prudent. All of the plan's investment fees um, must be prudent. So um, the employees ended up winning. And the best course of action here is the investment due diligence, hiring experts to help benchmark your plan fees, um, and then having documentation in the committee minutes. We take minutes, by the way, um, of all of our committee meetings. Um, So engaging in the prudent process, member process, 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 that is your most important line of defense um, when it comes to any sort of, you know, IRS audit, DOL audit, any lawsuit against you. Um, So making sure you know not only what you're paying, but making sure the fees are reasonable um, is really, really important. Um, Oh, if a plan is closing down a fund or mapping, um, just making sure you have the documentation of why you're doing that. You know, what what caused this decision to arise? Um, what concerns did you have on that fund that was closing? Um, so those are types of things that they want to see in the minutes. Um, a lot of times, too, we'll see target date funds. So that's a nice diversified option for your plan participants, whether it's target date funds or maybe model portfolios. Um, that's always a nice thing to offer for your uh, participants who don't want to select their own or don't want to work with us to select their own. So we do see a lot of model portfolios as well. Some of the major areas that um, auditors look at Um, Number one, timely and accurate depositing of the employee contributions. This is number one, making sure you're putting those deposits in on a timely basis, um, ensuring that participants receive their statements and disclosures on time, compliance with the fidelity bonding requirements, timely and accurate filing of that annual form 5500 with your tax return, um, potential conflicts of interest regarding plan investments, review of the plan fees and investments uh, expenses paid and review of investments in any employer securities. We don't see that one too much um, with employer stock, but that does come up from time to time. There's two types of um, fiduciary insurance and bonding requirements. So make sure you know the distinction here. So number one, ERISA fidelity bonds. This is required on all plans. It's a question on your questionnaire every year when you file your 5500 and do your compliance testing. Um, You need to have fidelity bond insurance equal to approximately 10% of your plan assets at the beginning of the calendar year up to half a million. Different from that, there's something called ERISA fiduciary insurance. This is not required, it is advised, and this is protection on an individual level. Um, It protects individuals who are serving as fiduciaries who may be charged, um, who who may have lawsuits against them. Um, It's it's protecting them and their personal assets. Here's just a screenshot of some sample documentation you may see during a committee meeting with us, agenda, minutes, uh, we will get the plan review from your provider, so executive summary, different metrics, investment policy statement I talked about, the investment analysis, of course, fee analysis, and then we like to talk through a plan for education. We, um, years ago, we started documenting that as well in the minutes. So again, you will be getting a checklist 
on the different things that we talked about. There's some good compliance deadlines in there. Um, just really quick before we wrap up, I have another poll here. Um, you can message me too if you have any specific topics here that you want to kind of dive deeper into. Um, today it was kind of a higher level overview. And of course, we could we can always dive deeper on different topics. Okay, just a couple more seconds. All right, I'm getting an error on sharing it, but looks like audit preparedness and legislative updates. So speaking of legislative updates, um, I, I do have, um, I encourage you all to attend our December webinar. So that's a part of our webinar series and it's covering the Secure 2.0 legislative updates. Um, we had one at the beginning of the year and we wanted to do another one because as the year has gone on, we've gotten some guidance. So that'd be a really good one for you to attend. I have a QR code that you can scan. Um, this is completely optional too. When you exit out of here, you are going to be getting a question questionnaire. And if you want to go through this additional training, it's called Fiduciary Essentials for Defined Contribution Plans, FEDC. We will pay for it. You can go through this training. It is um, a few sessions, quizzes at the end of each each session, and then there's a final exam. You will get some additional resources too, which are nice. So an audit checklist, um, a nice calendar with compliance dates. This is completely optional. I think this is nice for each plan sponsor to maybe go through at least once and just have in your file um, to, to show that you went through some additional training, furthered your knowledge. Um, so let me know if you want to do that. And then here's our website and our YouTube channel again for just additional resources. Here's our 2023 webinar schedule. As I mentioned, the Secure 2.0 webinar that's coming up in December, that'd be a really great one for any plan sponsor to attend. Um, if you can't attend it live, you can get the recording sent to you automatically afterwards and watch it later. But um, Gina on my team will be walking through the recent Secure 2.0 um, provision. Some are mandatory, some are optional, um, and they have varied timelines with them as well. Um, but that would be a good 30 minutes to attend. We also have a fiduciary summit every April. And so that'll be April 25th from eight to about noon. We always have really good food, really good topics and speakers. So again, here's the QR to sign up for upcoming webinars on November 16th. We have a financial planning, anticipating the unexpected. Um, it's, it's meant for anybody, you, your spouse, um, even um, friends, colleagues, coworkers, adult children. And then we have the Secure 2.0 update on December 7th. Okay. I covered a lot. Thank you so much for sticking with me. Again, you'll be getting some questions after you close out of here. Let me know if you'd like to do that additional training and you'll get the recording as well. I appreciate your time. Bye-bye.